morning this is pastor Kent with you and this is um, heaven Abba's church and we're looking at God's way not our way so word of prayer Abba thank you for being here with us bless God strengthen and keep me May your words perk spirits and unhardened hearts, and may know, and may they know that this is the true word of God. And we say these things in your son's name, Yeshua. Yaman. So, why do we, and what is our God? Um, why God's way and not our way? One of the most important things that I want to bring up to the attention is the bumper sticker that all of us in my day and age have seen. That Jesus or God is my co-pilot. I'm here to tell you that that is not the way it's supposed to be. <laughs> he's supposed to be at the wheel so let us look at the message first we're going to look at why God's way not our way um definition of God is a capitalized the supreme or ultimate reality such as a, a being a perfect in power wisdom and godness who is worshipped as a creator or ruler of the universe the Christian science intercorruptible divine principal ruler over all as eternal spiritual infinite mind in other words it controls our every thought emotion and feeling do we mess up yes we do um, secondly a being or object believed to have more than the natural abilities and the powers to the unique human wisdom, specifically one controlling a particular aspect or part of reality. Um, you know, thirdly, a person or thing or supreme level head and fourthly is a powerful ruler this is what makes up a proper God not the world's idea of what he is now does that mean that he's going to destroy us and mock us and wipe us off the face of the earth if we do wrong no because um, it says in the Bible 70 times 7 which, which which means that he will forgive us 490 times you know and I'm sure in my lifetime it's more than that now 
There are many word counts in the Bible, but this one is very interesting to me. Um, God is mentioned in the Bible 4,691 times in the Old Testament and 47 or, or 417 in the New. Now, if it was not important, do you think it would be that much in the Bible? And today, the Bible still stands as the number one best seller in the world. It's on the top 100 list. The topics we're going to look at are 10 examples of God's way that differing from men's ways. First, we're going to look at coals of fire. Then we're going to look at the example of Adam, or sorry, Abraham and Isaac. Then we are going to rejoice and weep in appreciation. Then we are going to look at the Battle of Jericho. Then we are going to turn the other cheek. Six, love your enemy. Then we're going to become part of Gideon's army, who is our father's general of God's armies. Then we are going to take a look at Noah. Then we are going to look at salvation is a gift, not a reward. And then we are going to look at one of the most perfect examples of how a man is supposed to be taught and taken toward God by looking at Job. Many times in the Bible we read a story about people trusting God, even though it did not make sense. This is an example of God's ways of being different than man's ways. The beauty of the following, God, even when they didn't understand what God was doing, is that each time they obeyed and trusted, then God gave them a tremendous victory. There are also examples in the Bible where a principle or teaching goes against human nature. Jesus's and Paul's teachings are full of these principles. We also see often in the book of wisdom, which is Proverbs, here are 10 examples of God's ways being different from man's. So first, we're going to go to the coals of fire. And we're going to look at Proverbs 25, verses 21 and 22. If thy enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. If he be thirsty, give him water to drink. For thou art heap of coals of fire upon his head, and the Lord shall reward thee. Our Lord and Savior will take care of us. You know, our Trinity, the Trinity, will take care of our enemies for us. All we need to do to, for an example to that is look at Acts chapter 8, where we see Saul on the way to uh, Damascus to destroy the Christians that believe in Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ came to him and said to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Not, why do you persecute my Christians? Not, why do you pursue my children? He took it very personal. 
in Romans 12, verses 19 and 21. 19 to 21 says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place upon wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing so, thou shalt heap coals on his head. How many of us have seen a person in a bad mood? <laughs> Probably all of us, you know. And when we look at that person and we engage in an argument with them, it usually goes pretty badly, right? But if we look at them and say, have a nice day or God bless you, you know, it changes them. These two passages have very a similar theme helping your enemy. It is not our place to try and destroy those who have done wrong toward us. We should leave the job of vengeance to the Lord. He promises he will take care of his own children. Allow him to do so. And what about these coals of fire? This is a figure of speech. In Bible times, in many places, still today, people carry things balanced on their heads. If the fire in your house went out, you would not be able to cook or keep the house warm. You would have to get some hot coals from a friend and carry them back to your house in a pail or on your head to help the coals of fire of someone's head meant to give them the life-sustaining fire they need to survive. Matthew 20, 22 verse 35 to 39 says that we are to love the Lord our God with all our hearts, with all our minds, and with all our souls. And equally as important to that is we should love our neighbor as he loved us. You know, it says that we should love the Lord our God with all our hearts, with all our souls, and with all our minds. And second, and equally as important to this, is that we should love our neighbor as we love ourselves. Now, let me clarify neighbor for you. It doesn't mean the person next door, the person you sit with, the person you go with coffee with. No, it means every single solitary human upon the face of the earth. Now, we're going to take a look at Abraham and Isaac. Go to Genesis 22. And he said, Take thy son, thy only son Isaac, for whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Morin, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon the mounts which I will tell you thereof. Now, this is an example of our Messiah in Genesis. So it's a precursor to what happened on the cross. God told Abraham to sacrifice his beloved son, Isaac, this, the son that had given to Abraham and Sarah, they were well beyond childbearing years. But Abraham trusted God. He knew that God would be victorious in the end. And if we have read that story, we know that uh, the Messiah provided a lamb. In Hebrews 
11 verse 9 accounting to that god was able to raise him up even from the dead from whence he received him in a figure abraham had full confidence that god would rise his son from the grave this was before abraham stood the coming of the resurrection of christ abraham was not thinking about the rapture as he had been taught anything of the sort from god but he trusted that god would do a miracle and raise his son even though he did not understand god's ways he trusted in god now we're going to look at rejoice and weeping appropriately let's go to romans 12 verse 15 rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep romans 12 is a great passage full of examples of god's teachings being different from the human nature in verse 15 paul tells us that we should rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who are hurting. Our nature does not always want us to do that. You see, this is called empathy, care, understanding, compassion. Well, never you want to call it whatever you want to say on it. Okay, it shows that we care for our fellow brothers and sisters. Okay. Maybe it is a bit easier to empathize with someone who is hurting than it is to rejoice when our friend rejoices. I have a dear friend whose mother died and um It's, it's hard to rejoice um, when somebody passes on. And now... Uh, we have to understand that we have to be there for that person that is hurting because that friend expects us to be there for them. Um, in my calendar, I get a reminder each year on the anniversary of Her death and I reach out to that friend some way each year to let them know I am thinking about him On that day You know, my mom is still alive. And uh, I lost dad five years ago, so um, I can relate uh, to that. So.
Um, this is how we show empathy for our fellow brothers and sisters is we relate to their suffering and we have to remind them that it's not forever. Um, my dad is in heaven um, and he can look upon me anytime he wants. But what about rejoicing with a friend when something good happens to them or even more difficult? Who do we respond when an enemy has reason to rejoice? It is much more difficult. This verse is tracked in between several other verses talking about how to treat those who are not your close friends. Children often are good examples of human nature and how contrary it is to God's desires. When one child wins a prize and the others do not, their reaction is sometimes criminal or at least it would be if they didn't so they weren't so close resembling their own reactions watch a child when their friend or enemy has something good or bad happen to them see if you can notice the way the human nature differs from God's ways you see when somebody's happy, we rejoice with them. When somebody's sad, we're sad with them. We shouldn't do that. You know, as a pastor, when somebody loses a loved one, which is a horrible thing, it's even worse when it's a parent, um, I don't say to them, well, I'm sorry for your loss, or rest in peace, or the usual garbly goop that everybody says. No, what I say to them is, um, it's only for a little while, or you'll see them again when you get to heaven. You see, this is how we are supposed to react to good and bad situations. Um, when a person is having something bad happen to them, my wife is very good at this when I'm feeling upset or uh, depressed or uh, hurt or um, disappointed. She always seems to be able to find that niche to make me smile. That's what I'm talking about. Let us look quickly at the Battle of Jericho. You'll find the Battle of Jericho in Joshua chapter 6. We're looking at a short portion of it from verses 3 to 5. And ye shall come past the city, all ye men of war, and go around that city once. Thus thou shalt do this for six days, and seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns and seven day ye shall come to pass the city seven times and the priest shall blow the trumpets and it shall come to pass that when they make that long blast from the ram's horn and when ye hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a loud great cry, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up, every man straight before him. So the walls of Jericho were three chariots wide. They were huge, and everybody in Jericho thought that 
these foolish Israelites will never be able to attack the city. But see, they were forgetting about that power, that creator, that our Trinity has, you know. Joshua stood looking at the city of Jericho when the captain of the Lord's host stood before him with his swords drawn against Joshua. Joshua asked if this angel was on the side of the children of Israel or worked for the enemy. And the angel replied that he was on neither side, but that he was a messenger from God. After blowing down before the mess sorry, bowing down before the messenger, Joshua heard a battle plan that probably did not make much sense to him at that time. <laughs> they were to walk around the city of Jericho once a day for six days, and then on the seventh day they were supposed to walk around the city seven times. The walls would fall down. As crazy as a plan sounded, Joshua went back and reported to the Hebrew soldiers that he was the way they would take the city. <coughs> you see, they obey. <coughs> <coughs> They obeyed God, and they saw victory, even when there was none, no hope, humanly possible for that to happen. But Jericho knew that his faith and trust was in a God of miracles. Now we're going to look at turn the other cheek. We're going to Matthew 5, verse 38 to 42. Ye have heard that if you have been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil, but whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn him Turn them also. If any person will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let them have thy coat also. And whosoever compel thee to go a mile, Go with them twine, in other words, twice, walk double. Give to him, asketh thee, and from him what would borrow of thee, turn not thy way. In other words, we are to give twice as much as we receive. This was from the Sermon on the Mount, taught to the people. Many things went contrary on a man's natural ways. Jesus told them that they should present themselves to their enemies in declare manner. Though traditionally wisdom said that they should repay an eye for an eye, Jesus now says that they should go out of their way to be kind to those who persecute them. Even God's Old Testament law taught an eye for an eye. But the thing to remember was that it was the law and those responsible for upholding the law to doyle out the punishment with which was not the role 
of the one who had been wronged yet people had taken the law into their own hands and chosen to mete out the punishment of their own way allow the legal system and god to give punishment as necessary do not take the law into your own hands while our nature teaches us that we should god's ways says that we should trust those within the authority <coughs> of course that doesn't mean that you should you know allow somebody to push you around either you have to defend yourself um, you know you can put your hands up or you can walk away you know um, sometimes fighting is the only way but you have to remember to use restraint when doing that um, and try not to hurt them any more than they hurt you um, the best way to do is to put them in a hold and call 911 that's the best way to do it you know six is love your enemy Matthew 5 verse 43 to 47 says ye have heard that in the hath been said thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy but I say to you love your enemies bless them that curse you do good to them that hate you and pray for them which disrespect you and use you and persecute you that ye may be the children of your father which is in heaven that ye may be the children of your father which is in heaven for he maketh the sun to rise and the evil on the good and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust for if ye love them which love you what reward have ye do not even the politicians the same and if ye salute your brother only what do ye move than others do not even the politicians so once again we look at the teachings of our messiah something contrary to the traditional wisdom he says that we should love our enemy it is nature to love those who are our friends in our family and care for us it's natural to show them love or at least who are not out to harm us but Jesus turns this tradition in wisdom upside down and tells us that we should love those who mistreat us God can send punishment as necessary you know all you need to do is look at the crucifixion of Christ and while he was being beaten battered whipped mocked at made fun of just about everything imaginable and then pinned to the cross all he kept saying to them was father forgive them for they know not <coughs> what they do if we do this seven is we join Gideon's army Judges 7 verse 7 says and the Lord said to Gideon but that the 300 men had lapped 
will I save you and deliver the Mennonites into thy hand and let all the people go every man unto his place God asked Gideon to go against an army of a hundred and thirty-five thousand with a handful of three hundred men Gideon started with thirty-two hundred men which was still a small number against an enemy yet God asked Gideon to pair army par the army down to just three hundred and when the victory came it was obvious that it was the hand of God you see this story is in uh, Judges chapter 7 you can read it there was three ways that the Lord dwindled and honed it down the army to 300 men the odds were 100 to 1 so make no mistake we have a God of miracles now we're going to look at Jonah in 8 Jonah 1 verses 1 to 3 now the world of the Lord came unto Jonah and said of the Amittai saying arise go to Nivea in the great city and cry against it for their wickedness is come up before me but Jonah rose up to flee into Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa and he found a ship going to Tarshish so he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord you see Jonah is an example of someone who did not agree with what God's plan and tried to run away from God's leading I did that for years you know I was never happy as a truck driver and as a farmhand I enjoyed the work but I was never happy of course he did not get very far on his own though he jumped on the ship to flee from God's presence God brought him back by the way of a great fish in the land where God called him make no mistake you can't run from God you know if God is calling you to do something make sure he, he can make a, a sure call that he's going to do it point nine salvation is a gift not a reward Romans 4 verses 2 to 5 says for if Abraham were justified by works he has therefore to glory but not before God for that saith the scripture Abraham believed God and is counted upon him afore righteousness now to him that worketh is the reward of the reckoning of the grace but of debate but to him that worketh not but believeth on him that justify the ungodly his their faith is counted for righteous many times in the Bible Abraham is referred to as a godly man Abraham's salvation came through faith in God and he promised Redeemer he was not saved by works and neither are we he is saved through faith which is a gift from God you know Ephesians 2 8 and 9 I love this scripture it's one of my favorite salvation scriptures for by the grace of God are ye saved through the faith and not 
of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Religion wants us to work for salvation, pay for salvation, do donations, you know, uh, pay tithes. That is a law, but they use it a different way. And, you know, but that is not what the Bible teaches. Salvation is a gift of grace from God. It is not something we can earn or purchase. The purchase was done by Christ on the cross and is now offered to us freely. Some people, because of pride and human nature, never accept this gift. They want to earn something that God says is impossible to earn. Some people believe they can buy their way into heaven. Some people believe that you get into heaven by the good works you do. Well, Job, and this is in closing, is how we get into heaven. And if you've never read the book of Job, I suggest you take the opportunity to read the book of Job because it shows so many times how we are supposed to handle trials and tribulations. Job 13 verses 15 to 16 Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. But I will maintain my own ways before him. He also shall be my salvation, for an hypocrite shall not come before him. Job learned to trust God in his time of horrible personal loss. He lost his children and all his possessions. He was even plagued by illness and companions who accused him of wrongdoing, which he had no, not committed. Even though all of this he trusted God. Through it all, he never lost his faith in God, which is one of the reasons why I love my wife so much. You know, through adversities, trials, and tribulations, she never once blamed man like I did. She knew that God would protect her and kept her faith as Job did. The book of Job is an amazing story of someone accepting God's ways even though he did not understand what God was doing. James says, Faith cometh by works, and we're not saved through works alone. We're saved because we believe and we understand. You know, you can do all the wonderful greatness that you can. And if you live in a, if you're in a watered down church that preaches, just be a good person and you'll get to heaven. I'm sorry to tell you, but it ain't going to happen. Okay. Being a Christian is a lot of hard work. You know, it takes dedication, it takes preservation, it takes honest and open mindedness. And sometimes it's really hard. But you know what? It's oh so worth it. You know, I can't stress it enough. You know, you have to do this. Um, you have to follow what our Lord says. Perhaps you're uncertain about your salvation and where you will spend eternity. But our Lord Adonai promised help in his word to anyone who seeks to know the truth by saying, Here am I. John 7 verse 17 says, If anyone chooses to do the Messiah's will, 
they will find out whether my teaching comes from Abba or the Father or whether I speak of my own or through the Spirit. The Spirit offers himself as a gift to anyone who trusts him. Let's make sure you're going to heaven. Say this simple prayer with me. Abba, Father, I am a sinner. I am sorry for my sins I have committed. I know my sins have put distance between us. I know the distance between us can be healed. I believe that Yeshua Christ died on the executioner's stake for my sins and rose on the third day. I now receive him as my personal Messiah and accept the gift of forgiveness and in return have everlasting life in the kingdom of heaven. Thank you, Abba, Father. In Adonai's Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. You know, let me be the first to welcome you in to the family of God. It only gets better. And here at Heaven's Abba's Church, we will help you grow. Contact me through my links and I will show you where to go next and teach you what was taught to me because we are to make disciples. May God bless and keep you. Thank you, Abba, for being here with us and for blessing this word. May it go forth, prick spirits and unhardened hearts. And I say these things in Yeshua's name. Yeah, man.